Uh, very good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to be here this uh, afternoon, giving us an opportunity to share with you our views on where the markets are headed. Um, I'll jump straight into it because, you know, we're keeping this whole session very tight, so I've got 20 minutes, so I'll quickly run through my strides in 20 minutes. Um, yeah, so let's quickly look back at how the markets have done so far this year, uh, and then, you know, uh, learn some lessons from it, and then, you know, go forward and see where the markets are headed. So unfortunately, I, uh, it's a sea of red. I don't have a lot of good news to bring you. <laughs> uh, so almost everything is down with the exception of the energy sector, which is up 31%, but energy was up even more. Uh, oil prices have pulled back a little bit, and so energy, but nevertheless, year to date, is up 31%. Now, the significance of this uh, performance numbers, two things. Number one, you see both equities and bonds are down quite sharply this year. Equities are down 25% and bonds are down 21%. Uh, this is rather unusual because if you cast your mind back for the, to the last 25 years, there have only been two instances where equities and bonds were down at the same time. Okay, only two instances since uh, 1977. Okay, so that's rather unusual. It's reflective of the very challenging investment environment uh, that we're facing right now. And the new normal that we're facing right now with so many moving parts and uncertainties. Secondly, bond markets are down by 21%, almost as much as equity markets. Now, bond markets are relatively more stable. So for it to be down 21%, it just tells you uh, the degree of risk aversion in the market. So a 21% decline in bond markets is very, very substantial. It's probably the worst performance in bond markets in history. Right? So we are living in very unusual times. What we're experiencing right now is very unusual. It, and it's gold. Gold tends to be a safe haven. Even gold is down almost 10% so far this year. So we are living in a very unusual environment, a new normal, uh, several moving parts, very challenging environment. So going forward, which is what you're more interested in, okay, uh, I take you through a process of looking at the economic and earnings outlook before we draw some conclusions. And you know, if I were to characterize the markets right now, I would say it's basically a tug of war taking place between the bulls and the bears. Right? So the headwinds are essentially things like you know, supply disruptions because of the COVID-19 crisis, the Ukraine crisis you know, causing supply disruptions as well, and causing commodity prices to increase quite significantly. Uh, you've got inflation. Inflation is the number one fear factor in the markets right now. Uh, it remains a fear factor in the markets. Uh, you've got very aggressive monetary policy, not just from the US Federal Reserve, from almost every major central bank in the world, including many Asian central banks that have high interest rates. Plus, the MAS has also tightened quite significantly. Uh, and you've got recession fears. I mean, the markets are very worried over recession. We don't have a recession yet in most parts of the world. But the markets are worried that it's going to hit us soon. And of course, with the recession comes the fear of earnings downgrades, because earnings are still very buoyant right now. If you have a recession, earnings will have to be taken down. And of course, the uncertainties in China. Right? The Chinese economy has slowed down very sharply. Uh, we are seeing a political transition in China, lots of changes in China. So, you know, you have several moving parts right now, several uncertainties at play, not just one or two, but several. And I can tell you that I've been in the markets for the last, what, 34 years, and I've never seen so many moving parts at the same time. But on the flip side, we're also living in very unusual times because you've got tailwinds. We have COVID for the last two years, and things are reopening, and you've got revenge spending pent-up demand, and you've got a very strong labour market. Labour market is very tight, uh, hard to find workers, you've got to pay uh, pretty high to get people to come in. So it's very unusual. Uh, you've got all these headwinds, at the same time you've got fear of recession, but at the same time, when you go to the restaurants, they're all full, Air airplanes are full, airports are full, everybody's travelling, everybody's just out to revenge spend, and that's, that in itself is a stimulus. It's keeping the economies alive, providing some degree of support for the economies. So you've got this start of war, and what is... Uh, the manifestation of the tug of, of war is the volatility you see in the markets. The markets are also confused, just like you and I, right? And so you're seeing the markets go up, down, up, down, and, you know, doing the tango. Economic growth is clearly slowing down quite sharply. Now, this is not my forecast. This is not OCBC's forecast. Uh, these are forecasts taken from consensus Bloomberg, right, from thousands of economies around the world, and you can see that uh, they are expecting economic growth to slow down sharply from 6% last year to about... 2.9% this year, and then it's slowing down further to 2.3%. Now, let me tell you, 2.3% world economic growth is like bordering on a recession. 
right? So with world economy, you don't need minus figures. You just need it to go below 2.5%. That usually signifies a recession. So 2.3%, we're almost there. Uh, and let me tell you, in the next six months, these numbers could be taken down even further, right? Now, this is what bothers me because earnings growth is still very buoyant. Analysts are still forecasting plus. In other words, earnings growth in 2023. So if there's a recession, there should also be an earnings recession, as the next chart will tell you, right? Or rather, let me just dwell on this chart a bit more, but you can see the numbers are all positive. Typically, when you have a, I'll show you a chart in a couple of minutes, uh, where, where when, typically when you have a recession, you also find earnings declining quite sharply. But right now, analysts are not forecasting a decline in earnings. And I guess the third quarter earnings season is validating it because the third quarter earnings season has turned out to be better than expected. And people are saying, where's that earnings recession, right? Third quarter earnings has caused the S&P 500 to rise by 9% in the last few weeks. And, uh, you know, so we've not seen it happen, but it doesn't mean that it won't happen, right? So we have a recession, you're going to see earnings being taken down, and that could be, you know, the next shoe to drop in the markets. And this is a chart that shows you what analysts are projecting in terms of earnings. And you can see the, num the, the chart hasn't come down. It's still up there. It's coming down very slightly. So in other words, there's a reluctance on the part of a lot of analysts to still take the numbers down, right? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, somehow people just cannot get themselves to take the numbers down because, you, the, you know, you look around, you, you don't feel like it's a recession. So how do you take the numbers down, right, as analysts? So I think people are looking for more validation and signs of it. But this is the chart I was telling you about. Typically, historically, when you see a recession, in the US, you find that earnings also takes a big knock. So I don't see how it can be any different this time around. If we do see a recession, uh, earnings will take a knock. Analysts will have to take the earnings forecast down. And I'm not sure whether that's fully priced into the markets. Uh, earnings recession, I feel, has not been fully priced into the markets. So recession, question mark. Problem is the job market in the US is not indicating a recession. Typically, the unemployment rate has to go up by 0.5% from the low, from the low. So the low US unemployment rate, the lowest is 3.5%. It's got to go up to about 4% before it signals a recession. And this is a pretty accurate signal of a recession. Historically, since 1960, every time the unemployment rate in the US picks up from the bottom by 0.5%, a recession happens. The lowest unemployment rate in the US so far is 3.5%. We've not seen it go to, go to 4%. So when the unemployment rate goes to 4%, 4.1%, that will be a clear signal. You're probably going to see a recession in time to come. But we're not seeing that happen, and which is why the analysts are also not taking their forecast down. But history tells us that the Fed very often miscalculates. That if you go, go back all the way to the 1950s, there's only been five, uh, all but five instances of Fed tightening has resulted in a recession. So the Fed is made up of human beings like you and me. You know, not God. So I guess they can also get it wrong. Right? They can miscalculate. Monetary policy is not a science. Right? It's a bit of an art. Right? You've got to feel and sometimes there's a lack effect in everything. So they can get it wrong. And if they get it wrong this time and they tighten too much, they will send the US and the world into a recession. But this time around, the Fed is actually, the Fed wants a recession. Because it's fighting inflation. It's not being able to bring inflation down. It wants to cause a recession. It's just hoping there will not be a deep recession. But the Fed is saying, look, between recession and inflation, inflation is a bigger, bigger, bigger uh, uh, animal, bigger uh, monster. So we are prepared to let the economy go into recession. But we'll find out. In, in the coming week, we'll have a very important Fed meeting. And let's, let's see what the Fed says. Everybody in the market is expecting the Fed to dial down. They think the Fed is going to pivot to a more dovish stance. Let's see, you know. Uh, I find it hard to believe the Fed will just suddenly change its view so quickly. And the probability of recession, this is again not my forecast, this is taken off Bloomberg uh, from several economies around the world, it's been on the rise. One year ago it was only a 10% probability of recession, but now it's 60%. And this 60% probability only happened in the last two weeks. So the 50% number was there for several weeks. Analysts were still not prepared to say more than 50% probability of recession. So 50-50 is like sitting on the fence. But now it's 60%. We've gone past that hurdle. We've gone across the border and said, okay, 60%. So pretty high chance of recession. And the yield curve, this yield curve has not failed to predict the last nine recessions in the US. And the yield curve 
is decisively in negative territory. In other words, the two-year yield in the US is higher than the 10-year yield. There are various ways to measure the yield curve, but one way is to look at the gap between the 2 and 10. That's negative. And as I said, in the last nine recessions in the US, the negative yield curve has successfully predicted a recession. And, you know, I think uh, if you look at the dividend futures, if you look at what uh, analysts are forecasting in terms of dividends, they expect dividends to come down quite significantly in 2023 and 2024. So in other words, analysts are very funny. Uh, or, or rather, this is not analysts, this is actually the futures market, sorry. So analysts are still sticking to their guns, but the futures market is predicting dividends will fall quite sharply in the next two years. So the futures market is saying, we will see a recession in two years. That's what the futures market is saying, looking at the dividend payouts. And I think, you know, if you look at recession, typically what happens is that, what's the implication of recession? When a recession happens, the stock markets do fall quite sharply. So if you look at history, Every time there's a recession, the markets do plunge. And the last time we had a recession, uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, the S&P 500 fell by 34%. Before that global financial crisis, it fell 57%. Uh, this time around, the S&P 500 is down by more than 20%. That was like a couple of weeks ago. Of course, it's rebounded a little bit. Uh, so so the, the S&P 500 actually is signaling that, you know, a, a recession is going to happen. This chart tells you that although bond yields have gone up and may continue to go up. Uh, in the short term, it does create volatility and fluctuation in the market, even drawdowns. But in the medium term, rising markets and rising bond yields can coexist. They can coexist. So yes, the bond yields are rising, it's causing a lot of fluctuation. But if you're a medium term investor taking a view of the next two years, three years, maybe even four years, and you've got the patience, uh, you know, eventually the markets will go past the bond yields and resume its uptrend, right? Now, this is the other silver lining around markets. The valuations have now come down to quite attractive levels. I look at the PE ratio, the forward PE ratio, and it's now trading at almost two standard deviations below the historical average, right? And you can see during COVID-19, right over there, okay, right over here, COVID-19, it was here. And now we are there. We're not there at COVID-19 levels, but we're not that far off. In other words, the sell-off in the markets have now created value. And if you're a patient investor with a long-term view, sometimes these buying opportunities don't always come. Okay, and I think the other factor is that there's a lot of liquidity on the sidelines. If you look at US money market funds, which are where people temporarily park their money before they decide where to invest, something like your six-month T-bills, three-month T-bills that people are investing in right now. Right now, it's perched at $4.6 trillion, record high. So lots of cash on the sidelines in the US, right? The last time it happened in global financial crisis, right over here, okay, $3.9 trillion, you saw a big buildup of money. And then as confidence returned to the markets, that buildup of money started getting applied to the markets. People started applying that, that, that cash and it fueled a rally. Over the next three years, S&P 500 rallied more than 70%. Global equities rallied more than 50%. Right now, we are perched up there. It hasn't been applied. It's not been drawn down. Imagine what can happen when it gets drawn down. Okay, you can see a very nice rally taking place. But of course not in the short term, over the next two, three years. So what will it take for the market to bottom? I think, you know, these are, in my view, everybody has a different view, but this is my view. You need clear signs that inflation is rolling over. We don't have that yet. Uh, you need clear signs that the Fed is softening its hawkish stance. We'll see whether that happens uh, come Wednesday. Um, you know, I mean, like I said, I find it hard to believe the Fed will pivot to a very dovish stance suddenly, not when inflation is so elevated. And thirdly, you need the recession fears to be priced in. And you're not seeing earnings take a hit yet. And until the earnings forecast come down significantly, I think, you know, recession fears have not been fully priced in. So the factors for a bottom are, I feel, not 100% there. And uh, yeah, so you may see markets rebound from time to time, but it, it may not be sustainable. And if you look at core inflation in the US, uh, still very high. I mean, it's not showing signs of coming down. I look at the core inflation, I don't look at the headline. Core inflation is still perched up there. And, you know, the unemployment market, as I said, is very, very tight in the US. The job market in the US is very tight. They're still creating jobs, 200,000 jobs, 300,000 jobs every month. The wages in the US are still growing at four and a half, five percent And that's the problem with the Fed. The Fed is trying to, the Fed has taken up interest rates by 3.25% so far this year, and the job market is not even budging. And 
as I said, wage growth is very strong in the US, 5% wage growth, you know, and uh, so the Fed is scratching his head and saying, what else do I need to do? But, you know, what's interesting is this, the Treasury market is saying that one year from now, the inflation rates will collapse. They're very high right now, but the f Treasury market is saying one year down the road, it's going to collapse. Do you believe it? Do you think it will happen? Okay, two years ago when COVID happened, right, and we all said, don't worry, lah, you know, two years later, you guys will be okay, you'll be traveling again, without masks, restaurants, everything else. But when you're in the middle of a storm, uh, hard to believe it, right? You, you, you just cannot see two years down the road. Lah. How to, you know, it's, no, lah, cannot, impossible. It's, very, it's human nature, it's very human, normal, right? Even the experts will, it's hard to see. But what the treasury market is saying is one year down the road, inflation rate will come down sharply. But for that to happen, the Fed has to hike rates sharply and we need to see a recession. But if inflation comes down to the level like this, confidence will slowly return back to the markets and you, you can imagine all the cash in on the sidelines will feel a rally. We're not there yet, but if the Fed succeeds in taming inflation, fighting inflation, we will get there. <clears throat> and the economy is also forecasting inflation will come down, right? From 7.4% 7, for world inflation in 2022 down to 3.3%. So inflation will eventually come down, you know? Inflation is not a fixture, it will come down. The Fed will, will eventually bring it down. But when, it, when the Fed does that, I think then the confidence comes back and the markets will resume its uptrend. How high can in interest rates go? Right now, Fed fund rate is 3.25%. The Fed fund futures market is saying that it will peak at 5%, right? And by March next year, 5%. That's what uh, the Fed fund futures market is saying. So there's another 175 basis points increase from the current level uh, in terms of the Fed fund rate. But let me tell you that if inflation doesn't come down, even after they push it up to 5%, then it may go even past 5%, right? So it, it, we're all waiting and watching and seeing what happens. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, um, yeah, I want to share a, a two or three shots with you and then I summarize, I come to the end of my presentation. This is what happened in, in the 1980s when uh, this very famous Fed chairman called Paul Walker fought inflation. He was seen as the most aggressive inflation fighter in the US and world history. Lah. He was dealing with a super high inflation rate of 14% in the US in the 1980s. He took the Fed fund rate up from 10% to 20%. 10% to 20%. He caused a recession in the US. He got a backlash, trade unions, job losses, all after him. But Ronald Reagan continued to support him, gave him a second term in office, and said, we need a guy like Volcker with a strong hand, strong head. Right? What happened then? When Volcker, the inflation hawk, more aggressive than any Fed you've seen so far, what happened then? What happened to the markets? Let's go back and look. When Volcker did what he did, the S&P 500 fell 27%. And when Volcker finally f won the battle against inflation and started easing monetary policy, S&P 500 rallied 224%. So S&P 500 rallied, corrected 27% over 20 months and rallied 224% over five years. So historically, let me tell you that bear markets tend to be much shorter than bull markets, right? So. What I'm trying to tell you is eventually the Fed will fight, win the battle against inflation and you will see a nice rally. So right now, S&P 500, when I did this chart, was down 23%. Fed, aggressive, aggressive, 1980s Paul Walker, down 27%. Down 23%. We're not that far off, right? Almost there. Is this the bottom? Maybe not, but if history tells any guide, we're not that far off from the bottom, right? And which is why the S&P 500 is also rallied. It hit 25% and now it's up almost 10%. So there's a lot of money waiting on the sidelines looking to bargain hunt when you see that sort of more than 20% fall in the S&P 500. It may come down again, but you know, I mean, it gives you an idea of how far the markets can fall when someone like Volcker fought the markets, uh, fought inflation in the 1980s. So in summary, uh, after saying all this, a bit of good news, a bit of bad news, I'm also doing the tango here, all right? And uh, get ready for very bumpy right in the next six months. Uh, I, I, I may be, they may call me an expert, but I'm no God. I can't tell you where inflation is going to go. I'm not sure what the Fed is going to do. We all got to wait and watch very carefully. Even the Fed doesn't know. The Fed got it wrong, remember. In 2021, the Fed got it wrong. Finally, they admitted their mistake in the first quarter of this year and they started pushing up rates. So they can get it wrong again, right? So none of us can, we have to wait and watch. And let's hope the Fed wins a battle against inflation. But the next six months is going to be very bumpy. But the good news is that the sharp correction in the markets have now made valuations attractive and 
presents an opportunity that sometimes, many, many years later, you look back and say, I wish, I wish. Right? So the concerns about inflation, interest rates, recession, they are going to be there for the next six months. But hopefully after six months, we have had so much of bad news. Bad news can never, ever go on forever. Dark clouds never end. Will, will never be dark clouds forever. The storm will, will have to stop and the blue skies will have to emerge. Right? If you focus on a storm, you'll be so frightened, you'll be in your caves. Sometimes it's also important to focus on the blue skies. So my, I, I, what we've been telling our clients also is that don't be too aggressive in buying if you intend to buy because none of us know the next six, nine months is going to be very tricky. But opportunities like this don't come every day. If you tread, tread very carefully, buy very carefully, buy very selectively, right? And buy over time if you have to buy. Don't buy all in one go, right? If you have to buy, right? And you need to have a good risk appetite. This is not a market for people with, if you're looking to buy equities, for example, it's not a market for people with a low risk appetite. You need to have the risk appetite. You must have the patience. If you're like me, watching the weighing scale every day, hoping to lose weight, you will give up. Which is what happened to me. Like, not, not lost weight because I've given up. Every day, look at weighing scale. Cannot look at weighing scale every day. Cannot look at markets every day. You must have the patience, right? Sometimes the good news is two, three years down the road. But you must have the holding power as well. So thank you very much for your time, and I hand you back to Edward. <laughs>